for being here. My name is Ashley Flynn and I am the Director of Research and Special Initiatives here at the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's webinar. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. The webinar will last about an hour. It will start with a 30 minute presentation followed by a 30 minute question and answer session. All participants are muted and we ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation. Please submit your questions using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and to a CTY recorded webinar page, which is where the recording will be posted once it's available. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Natish Thakur, our speaker for this evening. Dr. Thakur is a professor of biomedical engineering here at Johns Hopkins University and has been with the university since 1983. Dr. Thakur conducts research on neurological instrumentation, biomedical signal processing, micro and nanotechnologies, neural prosthesis, clinical applications of neural and rehabilitation technologies, and brain machine interface. He has authored more than 250 peer reviewed publications on these subjects and was the editor in chief of IEEE Transactions on Neural and Rehabilitation Engineering and presently serves that role for the Medical and Biological Engineering and Computing Journal. Dr. Thakur now directs the Laboratory for Neuroengineering and is also the director of the NIH Training Grant on Neuroengineering. One of his current research projects, in collaboration with a multi university consortium, is to develop a next generation neurally controlled upper limb prosthesis. Dr. Thakur, thank you so much for your willingness to join us in what is a very busy time at the university. We are eager to learn about this exciting new field and where CTY students might contribute to the next generation of solutions. I will hand it over to you now, Dr. Thakur. Hey, good evening. So I welcome all the students in the CTY program and I understand there are some parents there as well. You know, I'm very proud to say that four of my kids also were CTY students and trainees once upon a time. So this is really great for me to come back. <clears throat> now, uh, to begin with, a very important thing is that I hope you're all playing it safe. I hope you're all also taking time out to think about justice and equality. And then I hope that this is a strange summer where we are all in a sense stuck at home. I hope you'll make the most of your mind and body, stay engaged, do something interesting and exciting. Okay. With that, I want to start uh, my talk. Um, and this is about the Brain Machine Interface Project. And I want to tell you about how make, we can make the processes more human-like. That's the essence of the idea. Now, moving ahead, uh, you know, just to let you know that this kind of research at Johns Hopkins is done by combining what you see on the left side is our engineering campus and on the right side is our medical school campus and a collaboration that's made possible in the field of biomedical engineering. Okay, so let's see, we are going to build a brain machine interface. So brain, our nervous system is that, it's spine, it's nerves. But when something goes wrong, medicine or physicians, what they want to do is to restore or even rehabilitate, which is if your limb is lost, you rehabilitate or replace the limb. Restoration is when you have a brain injury or stroke or such, you want to restore the brain function. And spinal cord is from paralysis. And you can see that each of these disorders create a disease that you're familiar with, such as Alzheimer's, paralysis, or pain through the spinal cord or nerve injury on a limb. So let me start with my tutorial on the technology. So we are going to talk about processes. 
Oh, wow. So do you, do you know, can you see this objects? These are almost today's artificial limbs. The artificial legs on the left side and artificial Captain Hook kind of her arms on the right side. That is what vast majority of the world gets. However, there's a revolution underway. And this revolution is made possible ironically and very surprisingly by the war. US and allies fought a war back in Iraq, a number of American soldiers and allied soldiers. And indeed, the people in Iraq lost their limbs, lost their lives. And at that time, US government and its leading agencies called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, set about to say, we're going to revolutionize the prosthetic arm and give our wounded soldiers amazing human-like arm. And now you see some of the pictures of the arms that came about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the picture you see on the right side. So at the moment, some of you can think about what that picture represents. But picture on the lower uh, part of the slide shows what a today's cutting edge modern prosthetic arm looks like. It's what's called anthropomorphic or human life. The signals from the body, um, and then use those signals to help the person regain mobility. So you saw a little bit of that hand. The one on the right side is the million dollar revolutionary prosthetic limb from Johns Hopkins, developed by a consortium at Applied Physics Lab and a team of researchers at Hopkins and many other universities. And on the left side is by a local Baltimore area company called Infinite Biomedical Technologies. And you saw the video of the hand being used. So now this is the state of the art. Okay, but how do you control that hand? How do you control that arm? So I'm gonna give a little tutorial on both processes and a bit of machine learning that goes with it. So how do you give a signal to that robotic hand or robotic arm. Well, so we're going to start with what's so now called- I want you to squeeze. Yeah, so right here, these are the motor units that are happening from her spinal cord out to her muscle right here. And as she's doing it, you're seeing the electrical activity that's happening here. You give me a click here and try to see one of them. So keep doing it really, really hard. Yeah, so now we pause at one motor act. Okay, so that's the first secret. To pick up the signal from the arm, of course, this is a able-bodied individual and MPT may have some of the limb remaining, and that is where we can pick up the muscle signals that in fact carry the signal from the brain. So we're gonna figure out how to decode wow. that. But we're gonna need for that some machine learning. All right, so here is this animation that shows that this limb has some signals, and you can see part of the limb could be amputated. So we're gonna pick up some signals. These numbers represent the signals from those electrodes, the little round things that are sensors on the residual arm. And then our challenge is to decode that into this robotic hand movement. You see that it has got the thumb and fingers, it can pinch a card, it can pick up a coin. So what are, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to use a neural network at the very simplest level. A neural network is a basic mathematical simple construct that takes a combination of these signals and gives a decision. So input inside on the left side is the signals, the right side is the answer that move a index finger. Of course, it's not that simple. We need more advanced algorithms. So nowadays there are more multi-layer neural network, recurrent neural network, those kind of algorithms. Some of you bright kids should be taking classes in machine learning and neural network and pick this up. And then what we have to do is to make a decision. Is it a thumb or is it a finger? And it's not a simple thing. So you need some mathematical algorithms to say blue stands for one and orange stands for something else. And that's how we will decode those muscle signals and control the hand. It's a very quick, simple tutorial. All right, so let's see how it's going to work. So this was actually one of our very first subjects. So, 
She had elective surgery, this young lady. I mean, you know, she had a tumor in the arm and this limb had to be amputated. And what you see is that little dots are the sensors, the electrodes that pick up the signal. And then we decode using our machine learning and she is able to individually move an index finger or now a thumb. And that is how machine learning can control a prosthetic hand. Or advancing forward over a few years, now we developed a fully implemented prosthetic arm that works seamlessly. This gentleman just is going about his daily work at processes use at home. There's a lot of tricks inside in the design control sensors, but you can see that we've come a long way. It looks human-like and he's able to do everyday tasks. So I hope it has helped his daily life and at home and at work. So let's take an advancing step further because we want to know how to control that arm, but maybe with our brain, with our mind. And so that is what's the field of brain machine interface. Essential idea is that we want to control the processes with our mind, our thoughts. So a little tutorial about our on brain or neuroscience. So let's start with that. First thing, you're gonna see a brain cell for the first time. There it is, it's a neuron. Uh, it's, it's in a cell culture and it's growing out its tentacles. So it's cell body and what I call exons and it's growing out artificial. If you use some advanced imaging techniques, this is as if like hundreds of neurons are firing. They are active, they are working together. This is the brain at work. So this, you're seeing the brain at work. Now you're gonna hear and see the brain send out its code, its message. Well, that is, and it's gonna show up like spikes or what I call action potential. So those little, the noise was the background, which are hundreds of other brain cells. And those spikes are the few neurons that we are interested in. And that is the message we need to decode. Now I'm going to let you do in your homework, where did you last see this picture? But I'm going to play it as if like hundreds of neurons are working together. This is by the way from a movie, but it shows that as if like hundreds of neurons are working together and that's the code of the brain. And that's what we need to decipher. So brain machine interface to control a process is about decoding neurons. And from them, from those neurons, we need to figure out how brain and mind works. So you see a little picture of the brain inside the skull. There are many ways that we can go into the brain, like putting a bunch of electrodes on the brain surface, these dots or little needle-like electrodes to pick up from neurons. And then we get a variety of brain signals, but the one more interesting one is called EEG or electroencephalogram. It's a brain signal. So it can be used. And we're gonna use it to now control the prosthetic arm. So by the way, you see, you will see on the laptop, the brain waves are playing. The student is wearing a cap with white dots of the electrodes or the sensor that pick up the brain signal. Then we go around decoding it and it's conveyed to the prosthetic arm or robotic arm on the table as a demonstration to open and close. So that's progress. Now we are taking direct brain signal and taking it to the arm. So this is what we may call mind control. If you wanna know how well, EEG signal is like a signal, just like my voice signal and you use methods like Fourier transform. It's a way to decompose sound into different frequencies. We can do the same thing with brain waves. And then the machine learning. Remember the classifier I told you about, the blue and orange dots? Those kind of classifiers are used to say open or close. Take it further. Now this is even more advanced. Now this gentleman has lost his arm all the way at the shoulder, it's called transhumeral amputee. So he now controls the whole arm with the wrist and fingers, but he needs help. So we're gonna to have to 
take a signal from the brain, but that's very complicated. We'll come to that. So we, why not take the signal from the brain, which goes to the spinal cord, to the nerves, and then connect the nerves here, which then activates the muscles. And then we use machine learning and decode the message and control the robotic arm. So this is an amazing progress by number of institutions who collaborated to make these connections, even for a transhumeral amputee possible to control the robotic arm. Okay, we will go even further. Now, how about directly from the brain? So what you see here is that this lady who has is paralyzed essentially below the neck. So there is no other way to communicate other than directly from the brain. And what are on our, on our scalp or skull are a bunch of electrodes which those micro electrodes that they're called, they go into the skull, into the brain and pick up the little tiny signals from individual cells. Again, we will use machine learning and AI and then control the prosthetic arm. So now this is complete direct brain machine interface. And this can help patients, people with very high level paralysis or disease called ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease and so on. Well, but that's, so we move the arm, we can control the arm, but can you make it feel like what humans feel? So this was the video I wanted to show you. I saw this video, well, I saw this movie when I was a graduate student. Well, since you're, I cannot ask you a question directly, I'll give you the answer. So this is from the first Star Wars movie. So Luke Skywalker had his arm cut off and now the artificial arm is given and it has a sensation. So what you see in the movie comes alive. And so for all of you, today's homework is go watch some fantastic movie like this and make it real 30 years or 40 years from then. Well, let's see if it's reality. So to do that, we need to do what's called bidirectional. Not only move the prosthetic arm from the brain to the hand or the arm, so which is like the message is going from the brain to the arm to move, but now we need to make that artificial arm sense the touch that's happening and take that touch and the feeling back direct to the brain. So this is the bidirectional design. Well, we're gonna need help from robotics. And here is one example. This is a big robotic arm with a big robotic fingers, but it has got touch sensors built on it. And it's able to grab. What we're doing is we're developing a very smart prosthetic hand that allows an MPT to control each finger individually and also benefit from the aid of robotic assistance too. So with those sensors, on the fingertip, this robotic arm is able to grab a bottle and get some sense of touch. For an FET, it's actually very hard to contract their muscles many, many different ways to control all of the ways that our fingers move. And so what we do is we put these sensors on their remaining stump and then record them and try to interpret what the movement signals are. And because these signals so you get that idea that we need to put sensors on the fingers or prosthetic finger. We need to sense the movement and then we can take the information back. For so let's do that. How do we get that information back to the MPT? You know, it's not, you know, we're gonna to show touch, but not just touch, temperature, vibration. How about pain? So we're going to show a, Example here of a prosthetic hand. Oh, I think we lost. The video is lost, Jerry. Just stopped it.
Are you getting it? Yeah. It's working? Okay, so I'm going to, somehow there is a stoppage of video on my end, but it's coming across because, so I'm going to start communicating and talking to you while I present the slides. So here on this screen, what you see is that a soft skin-like sensor is on the hand and you're touching it. And when you touch it, these little red and blacks are the sensor signals directly from the hand to the, the prosthetic hand relayed back to the computer. So how can we use it? Well, so here is an example. This is a prosthetic hand which does not have sensor. So it's trying to pick up an egg and of course it breaks it because there is no sense of touch. Now this prosthesis has sensors on them and is able to pick the arm or hand is able to pick the egg. So sense of touch helps with delicate contacts and connections. But how about pain? And this is the most interesting work done by my graduate students. In fact, the, the subject, the amputee, is one of my own graduate students who is a bilateral amputee. We fitted him with his entire prosthetic arm. It has a hand and it has a sensor on it. Now, it's, he's delicately controlling the prosthetic hand to touch. And he is able to grasp this little object very softly and very gently. A little sharper object, it's, uh, I'm gonna fast forward. Now this is a sharp object, right? If you did that, you would feel a bit of pain. And this prosthetic hand is gonna feel exactly that because the sensor is picking up that little sharpness and he's, as soon as you get a pain, you get a reflex. You, you, you go back you, because it feels like a little tiny thorn or a tickle or maybe more painful and the prosthetic hand reflects. So we have conveyed to the amputee a sense of feeling of touch as well as pain. All right, so now in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna tell you about the future. You know, future is what you guys are gonna make of it. So let me help you dream. So first of all, this is, all of this is happening in what we call field of biomedical engineering. It's merging biology, medicine, and engineering. And I believe it's revolutionizing medicine in many different ways. And you saw an example here. Of course, you may have heard many examples, cochlear implant that gives hearing. There are technologies, devices called deep brain stimulation. They are like pacemakers for the brain. They treat Parkinson's, epilepsy. Retinal processes gives vision. And today I told you about neuroprocesses. It connects the brain, the limbs, upper, lower limb. And of course, this field is impacting many other areas of the body and many diseases and disorders. So today what I presented is the topic of neurorestoration, like restoring, bringing back movement. Also, I presented to you bringing back a sense of touch or sensory perception. So where do we go from here? This is a picture I showed you again. We can augment, repair, support brain, spinal cord, and peripheral limbs. And each one of them will help people with disorders or disease like Alzheimer's, paralyzed individual, or people who have lost their limbs. So I believe this is an age of brain restoration. When I started my school and my college, it was an era where miraculous technologies like artificial hearts were being developed. Today, we are developing the brain technologies. They are, as this picture shows, they are useful for muscles, for spinal cord, for nerves, for prosthesis, and for a variety of brain disease and disorders. Each of those areas, each of the body function can be restored with neurotechnologies. All right, so what can we do? So you'll find the next one, what we, able-bodied. So I'll play this video. This young man is gonna solve a Rubik's Cube with one hand. Do you guys know what the record is for doing that with two hands? 
Well, I'll give out the answer because I don't want to play the whole video. But in this case, with one hand, he solves an entire Rubik's Cube in less than 30 seconds. I believe the record for one hand is about five to six seconds of with two hands. So we have incredible dexterity. Okay, parents in the room, it's not just young people. Even the older people have amazing capability. So you get that idea. We are amazing. We have amazing brain working amazingly well with hands. But what about amputees? Can we have help amputees get there? So we're gonna need a lot of research, a lot of development. And of course, all of you young people, you're gonna need excellent education in engineering and sciences and artificial intelligence and robotics. So firstly, robotics. Here is an example how robotics can is advancing. This is a today's solution of a robotic hand solving a Rubik's cube. Of course, this is fast forwarded. Uh, so it took the robotic hand today four minutes, not like 30 seconds that you saw the young men do it. But robotics technology and investment in that along with vision and artificial intelligence can give you that capability. Or we have two hands, two arms. So how about two-handed, two-arm robotics? See, the two robotic arm with their hands with touch sensors are working together to do a job like cutting the pipe. So this is advancement in the field of robotics. Your education and research and investment in this will take you forward. Second is this whole research and development in the field of brain machine interface. Today at Johns Hopkins and other teams are developing bimanual brain machine interface. Two arms are working together. This gentleman has two probes on his brain and he's controlling two virtual arms in virtual space. So this is at the very leading edge. A lot of research needs to be done to take this in real life. Robotic arms have been controlled by mind. Yes, implanted with microelectrode arrays. One of the things that is helping cortex. it happen is that we're recording robotics. signals from the motor cortex and we are decoding these signals so that you can control a robotic arm. So what you saw was that a lot of implantable electronics, robotic hand, and of course decoding word, which is the machine learning. So this brain machine interface is working both ways, controlling as well as giving feeling. What you're seeing as the trials take place is that as the researcher applies light pressure to the robotic fingers, those physical sensations are converted into electrical signals that are... So you saw that sense of touch, it's possible. Of course, these are very leading edge examples of somebody getting a brain surgery and advanced robotics, but feasibility is short and long way to go to make it available for amputees. At the... College level, you will all have to learn more mathematics, more computing, more robotics, what we call in biomedical engineering modeling, which means we need to make, make models, like computer models, mathematical models of the arm, its muscle, these red things are the muscle models for different amputees, and then how they link to the robotic arm. So we would teach you modeling. You'll, we can use you know, virtual reality. So, here is the subject wearing a hollow lens, and then a person would see a robotic arm in a virtual space. This is what we set it up so that we hopefully an amputee then can learn to do all this at home by taking this hollow lens or other kind of augmented lenses and uh, work, see the world in virtual space and work the robotic arm. Then the topic of machine learning has come again and again, our artificial intelligence. These are algorithms to decode the brain and other activity. And here is work by one of my recent PhDs who used a variety of different machine learning algorithms to control individual fingers in dexterous tasks. And you see the percentage accuracy. There's somewhere between 70 to 99. 
but they're not perfect and they're still constrained. So we need very good advanced AI or machine learning methods. So what is machine learning? Since a lot of people may have questions about it. This is a very dense slide, but I'll draw circles to point out. So one of that is what is called deep learning. It's the hot technique that everybody talks about, but it's basically a neural network in this circle, but at many, many deep layers, kind of like the brain has many layers of neurons. And by giving it many, many examples to learn, it learns to figure out how to decode. And what is that decoding? so that these muscle signals or brain signals should be classified and separated in your hand and arm and so on. So this is your little tutorial into deep learning or machine learning. That technique is definitely going to help. Okay, and the last couple of two slides, I would say it's now time to dream and dream through innovation and entrepreneurship. And by the way, there are amazing jobs and careers out there. Elon Musk, who is very well known, he has formed a company called Neuralink to create these kind of implantable brain machine interface. There's another company called Control Labs, was bought over by, for a huge amount of money by Facebook to build, interact in virtual reality and real life with these kind of a bio brain machine interfaces. So there is a lot of industry evolving entrepreneurship in this field. But that's not the only reason to do this. We need to dream about a future for everyone. So one extreme is frugal engineering. Young kids lose limbs too. Kids in war-torn area because of accidents lose their lower limb. Kids grow, so the prosthetic arm or hand needs to grow. Maybe we can use 3D printing for that. And does a prosthetic arm need to look like a robot? I mean, can it be more human? In fact, can it be really artistic? You can see some incredible renditions of these ideas. So art and engineering might meet also. And last but not the least, let's all be happy. We should make amputees happy. And you know, they, they do feel that way. So the amputee is able to use the hand and listen to the music or play the music. So human brain is amazing. You know, it's a three pound mass, of course got, sorry, I, I mistyped, 100 billion neurons, not billion, 100 billion neurons, 10 to the power 15 synapses. And it has amazing movement, sensing and other capabilities. That's what we will need to tap. So here is the future towards better humans, better brains, and I'm now ready to take questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Thakur. We've had a lot of questions come in um, and they're really good questions. So kudos to all the students um, for sending these in. Um, I'm gonna start with um, a more general one. Um, could you tell us why they're actually called prosthetics? So a prosthetics is a, essentially what we are giving is an artificial arm, right? So prosthesis, by the way, doesn't just have to be for, for an arm or a hand. It is for a leg. And in fact, any other organ which can be supplemented is a prosthesis too. What inspired you to develop this type of technology? Oh, okay. So first of all, you should be in very capital letter plural. You know, a lot of researchers at many universities, a consortium has been working on it. In fact, for hundreds, thousands of years, metallic and then mechanical, uh, made up of wood and those kind of arms were, and legs were made. And you know, as I said, unfortunately, it's, it took a war to say that all for those wounded soldiers, let's give them a prosthetic hand or arm that is human-like. Because it took a lot of money and a lot of teamwork to revolutionize. And this is a field where like autonomous car or something, there isn't billions of dollars of industry or commercial money. So researchers and government plays an amazing role 
And that's what American government and DARPA as an agency, NIH, National Institute of Health, played a role in funding all the research and people like us contributed our parts. Some developed robotic arms, some developed uh, sensors, others developed these algorithms and code. As you saw, some of my students analyzed the EEG signals, others built the touch sensors. Today I presented, of course, is a blend of work done by my students at Johns Hopkins, as well as a number of other institutions. I think it's essentially, I think it captures your imagination. You can see that the mind is working to achieve something amazing like dexterity, right? Who has dexterity? Humans, maybe monkeys to some extent, and some vertebrates and such. So we want to get to that as to how that brain does it and it teaches us science. So that is the commitment to basic science. I think what another thing that happened is that there is an incredible convergence of technology, robotics, AI, and we are all tapping into that. And so I think answer to the question is why we as a whole scientific enterprise did it is because there is a need, there was funding and resources available, and we have come to a time where technologies like robotics and AI and everything is coming together. How many motors are there in a standard prosthetic arm? Oh, uh, well, you know, that, that's a, uh, you know, make, makes us feel bad because just to give you some idea, the number of, there are 33 bones in our wrists and we have each one of, you can see that we have joints and we have muscles and tendons and we are amazing human body. And our robotic hand on the blue hand essentially had five motors pulling on a, on a pulley essentially to, open and close it. This was about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the, the applied physics at Johns Hopkins hand has now able to control each of the fingers and individual digits. So between 20 and 30 motors can be active. There, that's why you can see in this lower left-hand picture, the robotic arm itself is quite big and to miniaturizing the motors is a challenge, but the bigger problem is also to control and achieve the decoding, not just the motor and mechatronic. But of course, we, we need to miniaturize it, make them be more silent, make them more reliable. There's a lot to do. Why are there so many wires and inputs on the shoulder? Oh, because we are still not there yet. This is like a prototype. Think about a modern day car or a rocket or something. It was just like a prototype in a lab. And uh, it's just not, getting fully packaged. So what happens is a lot of electronics, a lot of computer is outside. Um, and you know it has to be miniaturized using IC, integrated circuit technology, so it can be implanted or it can be miniaturized to put inside the arm. The, the motors have to be very small. So we're getting there. Right now, some of these chips and the, I don't know if you can see the picture, but the person who has got two probes sticking out of the head and they'll all be miniaturized to go into the brain, kind of like a pacemaker. All the wires for the robots, they will go. It won't take long. It's just a matter of miniaturization and making things more reliable. How is it different trying to make a prosthetic hand versus a prosthetic arm? Uh -huh. So the arm is, of course, your shoulder, elbow, and then wrist. And the hand is from wrist to the fingers and digits. And hand is really hard. Of course, arm is important, but what we call degrees of freedom, right? So shoulder has some rotation and you know you can lift it and lower it. Elbow has two degrees of freedom. Wrist is really complicated. In fact, we haven't really come across good wrist solution. So let's just leave it for the future. The hand and fingers, we don't have to control every finger. In fact, the thumb and index finger can achieve a lot and three fingers achieve a lot of things we do. So a lot of robotics is what's called underactuated. So making the hand the challenge is that it's so small and everything to fit into the hand is a challenge. And then wrist is really difficult to make. As I told you, right, there are 30 plus bones in a wrist and we put two or three motors there. So, so it's, the challenge is miniaturization. Do these prosthetics need to be recharged? Ah, they need to be powered. That would be the correct way to say it, right? It has to have power, right? We 
we apply power to our muscles and then muscles move the tendons and then the bones and therefore our arm and a hand. So the robotic arm or a prosthetic arm needs power and power can be delivered by, it's like electric cars. It has to be delivered by electricity, which is ideally variable, which means batteries and batteries need to be charged. So yes, they, we will need really good batteries, but thankfully because of all the battery revolution for cell phones and the cars, we're gonna jump into it. By the way, there is an interesting history about that kind of lithium batteries that you all know. They were actually first, some of the best batteries were developed for medical application, the implantable pacemaker. And that's where the lithium battery was needed because you needed a pacemaker in the body to last for at least 10 years. And now those batteries have found a huge commercial market uh, in uh, many things like uh, implantable other devices, implantable heart valve, heart pumps, and so on, uh, in brain, deep brain stimulation devices. And now we are going to need them similar batteries, high powered batteries for prosthetic arm. Now, luckily, if it's a prosthetic arm, the battery will be outside the body. So initially we will have the batteries on the backpack or on a belt, and then later on it would be in the arm. But then we have another problem, the weight that the MPT has to carry. And so some of the research is not only esoteric like AI. It is also about weight and about reliability and miniaturization and so on. And finally, to make it all look good, human life. But a good question. How do we keep prosthetics from being rejected by the body? So let me answer it in two parts. So one is that this process is, is by and large not implanted. So for the arm and robot is attached to the limb. So the problem is of attaching to the limb and you know, think about it like a big weight attached to at your elbow or shoulder. So it's the attachment is, is a bit of a problem, but the body doesn't reject it, but we don't like the weight and the load and all that. So there's a revolution in prosthetic uh, robotics called soft robotics. So we may make it like that. But then there is, there is an implantable component, which is that if we put probes inside the brain, then brain doesn't like that. So there is a lot of research to make those little probes. They're made up of silicon so that they can connect to hundreds, if not thousands of cells. And again, NIH, National Institute of Health has a grand challenge initiative to create these kind of thousands of brain probes so that we can record from the brain. And then surprisingly, brain is tolerant. So it doesn't again reject it as much. There's some damage, but there's not so much an issue of rejection. So that's the one part. But the, let me give you a second part. How do we prevent an amputee from rejecting this artificial arm? Many amputees, after a while, don't want it because it's ungainly, it's not good looking, it's robotic looking, it's heavy, it makes noise, it moves slowly. And then Peter says, it, this doesn't work for me. And so there is that aesthetic part of it, which also leads to actually today, leads to rejection. And we need to improve the robotic, the prosthetic technology so that MPT is accepted as a natural extension of the limb. What part of the brain is used while moving a virtual arm? Very good question. And that requires you to be, learn a bit neuroscience. You know, so far, by and large, I use the word brain. And of course, the brain has these 100 billion neurons, to be precise, about 80 billion neurons. And 10 to power 15 synapses, they're all over. But then brain has some organization too. So like a back of your neck in that area is visual cortex. The front of our head is the frontal lobe, the, the place where we think and learn and imagine and what to do with it's called executive function. But somewhere in the middle of our head is what is called somatosensory cortex. So it's part sensory and part motor, which means movement. And a lot of neurons are specialized in moving the arm are in that mid part of the brain. But if we have to implant, of course, today we implant, as you can see, if this picture is visible to you, that these probes are going into that mid part of the brain, the somatosensory cortex. 
However, I should also point out that when we do anything, if I move my arm, move my hand, and I touch and feel, the whole brain, like an orchestra, it's like an orchestra. It's not just a piano, it's not just a violin, it's an orchestra. So today we can put as if like we're playing one or two instruments. Later we'll have to play the whole orchestra of hundreds of, from hundreds of neurons today to thousands and millions of neurons to make that orchestra happen. So we we'll have to find specialized area of the brain and decode the message from each one of them to do it right. If a person is born with no limbs and the brain has no muscle memory of movement, can it be taught? Wow, now you're asking me a tough question. So uh, this will stretch my medical knowledge. Uh, but yeah, that's tough because if you don't teach in, at birth and in very early childhood, the brain, it's, it's what you have heard many times, use it or lose it and brain loses that capability. So these early years from zero to five are profoundly important. This is where the, whatever is used, we are, we are born with far more brain cells than we have as adults. And they're pruned out when they're not used by age five, seven, nine, many of them are pruned out. It's not just brain cells, but synapses. In fact, many of you have heard that language new language is very hard to pick up after age nine to maybe about 12. And so, you know, we have to use that brain and then a, a child that's born with any limb, not ability to move would likely lose the function. Infants with similar hearing loss is the same challenge. Hearing loss later in life, the areas of the brain are intact. They've learned to learn to hear. Same thing with vision. And so that's a profound disability, but earlier we can give the restoration, the better. Let the brain learn. There's a word called plasticity, which is very important word for neuroscience or for brain. Brain learns, brain wants to learn all the time. And it learns by doing, it learns by practice. And so we need to give it practice. For your studies, you learn, you memorize. By the way, sleep, all of you sleep better because Brain learns and memorizes during sleep more than anything else, or at least learns not to forget. And so sleep is extremely important. All those go together to develop the brain as you go from infant to childhood to adult. Practice, practice makes perfect. Or use it or lose it for neuroscience. Is the robotics arm's reaction time slower than a regular reaction time? Uh, so the video I showed with my graduate student Luke uh, implemented, he in fact programmed it to exactly the same reaction time, about 100 milliseconds. But the mechatronic gets in the way, it's slower. And so, and it's still clunky, you know, making noise and moving and so on. So. You can see that uh, this robotic hand, if you see the picture on the lower hand, it's solving the Rubik's cube, but in about four minutes. And uh, the, the young man who solved the Rubik's cube did it in about 30 seconds. I don't think that's a limiting factor. The robotics will be, you know, I can show any number of things that are so much faster. So it's not a limiting challenge these days. The hardest part is, the interface from robotics to the body, both ways. How do you make machine connect to the body? And how do you take the message from the body to the machine? How much does a prosthetic arm cost? And do insurance companies pay for these types of advanced prosthetics? Yeah, very good question. These are what's gonna make things to come real life. Now, yes, insurance companies, pays, Vet Veterans Administration takes care of our wounded soldiers. Fortunately, after these 10, 15 years of revolution, they have become affordable. In fact, some of the prosthetic hand that I showed, you know, they will cost a uh, hand about 15,000, but by the time you put the socket and attachment and the arm part, part of it and the muscle control, it could add up to 50, $60,000. 
the, the modular prosthetics limb from Applied Physics Lab, another company called DECA from, that was developed by Dean Kamen. And these are one, one of a kind million dollar arms. They are the, essentially the spaceships or space shuttle of the world. So they are not, they are affordable in US by insurance or those who have it. They are not affordable and available for rest of the world. And so we have a long way to go to reduce the cost, the reliability and so on. Is it possible to use cheaper materials like 3D printed parts to make more affordable prosthetics that still work like these? Whoever asked the question is going to do it. You guys have this incredible opportunity. You know, every generation has this new opportunity to work with new things. So you now have the access to 3D printers in schools. So you can print, I showed one picture, right? 3D printed hand. Uh, and like many things, 3D printing is moving very rapidly. They're talking about making Martian colony with 3D printers there. There are 3D printers for printing organs. So I think 3D printing is going to play an incredible role for the structure part of it. We'll still need the motors and gears or tendons and so on. We'll still need the power. But I think 3D printing will play a tremendous role. We should 3D print skin to go on top of the robotic or prosthetic hand so that it looks more natural. Uh, we have to be careful by saying cheaper material. Things that, that are cheaper are not always better. So they go hand in hand. You have to make it cheaper and better together. And that also happens through evolution of the technology and sometimes revolution, right? So motor cars have metal and now they are replaced increasingly by hard, very good quality plastics. So I think this is a, what I would call technology evolution that will take care of it. Why would we want prosthetics to feel pain? Wouldn't it be better if they didn't allow people to feel pain? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, you know, when we published that paper, we got tens of thousands, actually huge number in millions uh, clicks and you know, all of that by the search, uh, web search people told us. And the most, I mean, the people were attracted to it because of the pain. And there were questions like, like, why would I want to feel the pain? Well, I mean, it's not so much that I want to feel the pain, but why do we have the sense of pain to protect ourselves? Today I went out and walked in the woods and a sharp needle-like, thorn-like thing cut through my shoe into my foot. I needed to feel the pain to know that I was hurting myself, I would bleed. So the pain is protective. Pain is natural part of who and what we are. And it's part of a range of our perception. So it's not so much that we want to intentionally give pain, but rather, give the opportunity to perceive pain. Let's give another example, heat or temperature. If we couldn't feel the heat or temperature in the kitchen, we would burn our hand. So we need a sense of touch, we need a sense of temperature, we need a sense of pain in a spectrum to be more human and work with our environment, with everything we do. How and where is pain felt when a prosthetic arm touches something that can hurt you? Wow, that's another tough question. So the pain perception starts in your skin. There are what are called receptors. They are essentially neurons that code for touch. But nerves, free nerve endings also pick up these pain signals. Then that is relayed by specialized fibers that carry that, that message. And there are pain relating fibers. They're fast, they relay that message very fast. Then it goes to the spinal cord and it does some processing. Now spinal cord plays a very important role because you saw the reflex, that reflex is my spinal cord. It said, you know, I don't have time to take it all the way to the brain, process it. I gotta prevent the pain, I gotta prevent the harm. And so spinal cord is a kind of an extension of our nervous system and it processes the pain and gives feedback. And then of course, higher level perception and cognition, adaptation to pain, after a while you get numbed. All those high level processing happens in the brain. So you might also ask the question, how do I block pain? Which is a really, really important question. There are big research initiatives now to prevent the pain. And uh, sometimes it leads to drug addiction because people want to take 
pain preventing drugs. And there are these medicines that can block at the periphery. There are devices that stimulate the spinal cord to block the pain. You can stimulate the spinal cord or the brain to give an artificial perception of pain. Uh, obviously, again, you don't want to do it, but you, to know which part of the brain is doing what, sometimes you can give electric stimulation. So the pain is perceived at all levels, but it's processed in the spinal cord in the brain, and it can be blocked and treated at all levels. Are people able to change the level of pain tolerance in the prosthetic arm? Say they want a garden, but they don't want to feel the pain from the thorns. Yeah, so, so first of all, human beings also adapt or tolerate, develop different tolerance to that. So that's something we must remember. Uh, in the prosthetic arm, it's a, essentially a computer program. So what it is, is that how sens sensitive is my sensor? And from that, my computer program is saying, okay, take this signal, and give a little tiny, the way we delivered this message is give a little tiny electrical tingling shock to the, the limb. And when the person, the amputee felt the tingling, he said, oh, hold on, I don't like it. And so you can control the amount of current you can give to give that tingling sensation. So it's, it's easily programmable, but it's, it's, it's still at the limb, right? It's not the true pain that goes from the limb to the nerve, to the spinal cord, to the brain. And that's a very deep and complex topic. What are some of the limitations in prosthetics, especially when applied to intricate tasks? Yeah, well, let's bring, break it up into different parts. One is obviously visible, which is mechanical, mechatronic, right? They don't look like human end, they make this sound, they move slowly, they don't have that speed and dexterity, they're motors and gears and pulleys which will break down, they're heavy, they're metal-like, so that's sort of one area that's limited. The other area is all the electronics, you know, we talked about implantation, it has to be miniaturized into chips. So it has to be made tiny, like a pacemaker that you put in the body and forget about it. And so that advancement has to occur. Then there is this machine learning and decoding, these algorithms that decode the message from the body or give the message to the neurons. And that's a mathematical computational challenge. And then there is a bio interface, right? Something has to connect between machine and the body, right? Those connections are through the skin, through the implant, creates a challenge. Body, we discussed that, right? Biocompatibility or body rejecting or not rejecting. And lastly, human aesthetics. We need to like, we need to accept, we need to make it part of us. And that also is not easy. Are there prosthetics for kids that grow along with them? Oh my gosh, uh, not yet, uh, not at all. Uh, so that's why the question about 3D printing that we would need to, it would be great to 3D print as the kids grow and the hand or arm can be replaced by a bigger one, but it doesn't grow. So the robotics, Today's robotics is not that. There's a very, very cutting edge research on materials that self-regenerate or materials that heal. So there is research on skin-like thing on a surface that if you cut it, it heals by what's called material is called polymer that bleeds and fills up that crack. It's used for paint. So if paint, if you scratch your car, the paint bleeds and covers up. So there is a very, very cutting edge preliminary work on these healing materials, but growing materials and growing robots. I mean, I've read a paper here and there that they take cue from like wine that grows because it makes new polymers that it grows. And polymer is like a molecule that's very large molecule and needs to make itself. Very advanced topic. But you know, on Mars, we like to have 3D printers that print themselves, you know, if we humans are going to go to Mars. So, you know, the, you know, I would start with something like 3D printing and some very advanced materials. Could the robot solving the Rubik's Cube see it when solving it? <laughs> very good question, yes. So we have to, right? Uh, because the, the Rubik's Cube has a color and all of that, so they have to be aligned. Uh, and uh, so we do research, uh, in fact, even in my lab, hand-eye coordination. So you know, we need to be able to see, 
you know, the, the job I showed you about cutting uh, with two arms, had a camera telling where to go and grab and then how to, you know, how much to cut. So yes, we, it is really helpful to have eyes. Now the funny thing is like a robotic prosthetic hand doesn't have eyes. So what we did, one of my students put a camera on the hand, kind of looks odd, right? The hand has a camera on it, so a hand that sees, but it sees a very limited view. So it's, we would probably need head mounted cameras. So that, and then how do you merge the camera's view and the hand's view into one very, Interesting, very challenging question. By the way, again, a lot of, one thing you have to understand is a lot of these technologies and fields are interconnected. So we see that when you kids play augmented reality, virtual reality game, right? You have, you got an immersion to see, and then you're moving something. And now little by little, you're gonna start getting feelings back, the vibration and such. So, so that kind of advancement in the field of virtual reality where you integrate what you see and what you do will help the field of robotics or prosthetics actually. Prosthetics researchers, we tap a lot into various fields from robotics to AI to materials and mechatronics and so on. And I'm gonna end with this last question looking toward the future. How many years do you think it will take for our prosthetics to reach the Star Wars level? I, I, I thought, I told you, showed you that uh, what I saw as a graduate student, my student did it probably a little bit better. It, it had a sensation, it had a reflex. I think we've reached it. So, so hello, we have, we have done that. But I think if you ask a general question, you know, any and everything, there's a step ahead, right? I mean, if you see movie Avatar, or if you see something else and each one projects your imagination. And so, since you said this is the last question, doesn't professor get to give a homework? So everyone has a homework. Go see an amazing movie and get inspired, guys. You know, kids, you know, you, you, you will get inspiration from these movies or amazing books and stay on top of these kind of cutting edge research videos, YouTube, whatever, right? Or talk like this and you'll get some inspiration. Maybe you need Avatar like something, or maybe you need Star Wars like something, or maybe uh, you need sensors, you need robots, you need AI, get inspired. Just go watch a fantastic movie today and give a talk like mine 30 years from now. Once again, thank you to Dr. Thakur. I've learned so much tonight and I'm sure our students have too. And I think there are a lot of future biomedical engineers with us tonight. And all kinds of things, do great work. You know, take Absolutely. your fantastic CTY education and opportunity you have, it's precious and make some, make the best of it. Stay safe, do good for the world, uh, you know, in any which way, be kind and considerate of all, everyone. Same as different and be bright and do come back with giving a talk like mine years from now. Also, I wanna thank our amazing audience this evening. Um, we actually received over 200 questions and are so sorry that we could not get to all of them, but I think we would probably be here until midnight if we went through each and every one, but they were excellent questions that came in. Um, as a reminder, please visit the CTY Facebook events page where we will be posting more speaker series events throughout the summer. And also remember when we adjourn momentarily, you will be directed to a CTY web page, which is where the recording of this webinar will be posted once it's available. Please have a great night and thank you again for joining us. Goodbye. Good night, everyone.